Well, called to care is a wonderful ministry. Uh, it emphasizes something that we really believe, which is that God has a big heart for vulnerable children. And if you don't want to take my word for it, our text today completely reinforces that this is true. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 9, kind of give you some background to start out. He was born into a royal family. His grandfather was the king. His father was next in line. It wasn't a thriving kingdom or a wealthy kingdom or a world power dominant kind of kingdom, but they had enough. He was uh, third in line for the kingship, had access to the best food and education and provision available, all was seeming well. But when he was five years old, his life would dramatically and tragically change through a series of almost inconceivable events. His grandfather, the king, died in an intense battle against a rival tribal group. His father was killed that same day, along with his two uncles, in the same battle, all on a mountain called Mount Goboa. Presumably, one of the next in the royal line, his life was in danger. So his nurse, who took care of him, was shocked, terrified, when she heard the news that uh, her grandfather, the king, and uh, his father were dead. And anxious to get him to safety quickly, she tripped and threw him forward. And as he hit the ground, he incurred an injury that would cripple him for the rest of his life and his legs. Stunning series of events. You know, the beginning of the day was one thing. The end of the day was a complete other thing. A child now has no family left to raise him, no home to sleep in, nothing to look forward to. He was an orphan, afraid and alone. His name was Mephibosheth. You guys want to say that out loud? Because it's kind of fun. Mephibosheth. Whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, who was uh, the son of Israel's first king, Saul. Saul was selected by God to be king, but fell out of favor with God fairly quickly when he stopped being faithful to God's words. So God had already selected a new king, a young shepherd from the hill country, who didn't have any of the normal qualifications or characteristics that people would look for in a king. But he did have one thing. According to God, he was a man after God's own heart. That played itself out repeatedly as David had chance after chance to kill the king and assume leadership of the kingdom. And if he were even a little misguided, he could have uh, kind of assumed that that's what God wanted him to do. How he was, after all, God's hand-picked predecessor, right? I mean, or a uh, hand-picked successor to the throne. He already knew that he was supposed to be king, but he never took action on it. He never questioned Saul's authority. He treated him with kindness and respect, and he honored him. He said, if God wants me to be king, he can make me king. He can do it without my help. And because he remained faithful to God, and in David's words, God, God's anointed one, the king, um, he was blessed. Now, one of the ways that he proved his faithfulness to Saul was that he uh, developed his friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And they had a tremendous friendship, and the kind of friendship that you only find once or twice in a lifetime, they had a real genuine love for each other. And so when David exposed Saul's plan to kill him, because David wouldn't kill Saul, but Saul had no problem killing David. <laughs> he was always looking for ways to kill David. And David says, hey, uh, Jonathan, your dad's trying to kill me again. And if you help me, that'd be great. And so Jonathan does help him. And because of that whole sequence of events where Jonathan helps him, Jonathan asks this of David. Um, as long as I live, this is in 1 Samuel 20, promise me that you'll show me kindness because of the Lord. And even when I die, never stop being kind to my family. The Lord will wipe each of David's enemies off the face of the earth. At that time, if Jonathan's name is cut off from David's family, then may the Lord punish David's house. Once again, Jonathan swore an oath to David because of his love for David. He loved David as much as he loved himself. So, the two of them make this covenant together where David agrees that he's going to take care of Jonathan's family, even if Jonathan and all of Saul's family pass away. Well, that's exactly what happens, right? 
go fast forward back to that day, that tragic day for Mephibosheth. He's now crippled. He has lost his heritage. He's now sent off to live in this desolate place called Lodabar, and translated that name means land of nothing, which is a cool name for a city. Mephibosheth has been re reduced to having nothing. The only thing that's left is his life. That's all he has. And that could possibly be in danger because it was custom that when a ruler was defeated, his family would be killed as well. So, you know, there would be no descendants that pop up and challenge his authority, challenge for the throne. So David could have had Mephibosheth killed, but that's not what he does. He's a man after God's own heart. He does something else. And that's what we're going to read about in 2 Samuel chapter 9. That's what it says. David asked, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he was summoned to David. The king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service. The king said, is there anyone remaining of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there remains a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of some guy at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from that guy's house. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, I'm your servant. David said, do not be afraid, for I'll show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. And he paid honor and said, what is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and all to his house I have given uh, to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. But your master's grandson Mephibosheth shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that you command, We'll do it. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. All who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. So Mephibosheth is called out of the land of nothing, invited to appear before king. And he's apparently afraid of what that might mean, but David assures him, you don't have to be afraid. What he gets is something beyond what he could have imagined possible as he's, you know, making his journey there, probably thinking, what's going to happen when I stand before the king? What, it, what he's given is all of his grandfather, the king's land back. He's given these servants. He's given safety and provision for his wife and son. And most of all, he is given a never-ending seat to dine at the king's table. It's an incredible honor. Mephibosheth sees it as such an honor that he doesn't think he deserves it. And in humility says, who am I that you should look on me? I'm, I'm like a dead dog. He doesn't think he has any value. His life circumstances have taught them that. He isn't worthy to sit there, not with the king. But David's answer is a resounding, you are valuable. And this line is beautiful. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. I don't know if you noticed this. That's 13 verses, all of chapter 9. I read all of chapter 9. 13 verses. In that time, four times it reiterates that Mephibosheth sat at the king's table. He's called out of the land of nothing and given a seat there. It's an unbelievable turn of events for Mephibosheth. And the reason that we're telling this story today to wrap up this series is because it's, it's a real meaningful story for us. It's a real meaningful story for us understanding this whole concept of the table for two reasons. First, we all are Mephibosheth. We all are Mephibosheth. Sons and daughters of royalty, ripped away by tragedy and dysfunction, exiled to live in the land of nothing. We are crippled, alone, 
and afraid. But out of his kindness and mercy, God has invited us to his house. He's poured out blessings on us like we could never imagine or deserve. And he's given us a seat at his table. He's given us a place to belong. So we all are Mephibosheth. That's one reason this story is so significant. Second reason this story holds such significance for us is that we all know Mephibosheth. We all know Mephibosheth. People everywhere are out there looking for a place to belong, searching high and low for it. We're seeking it in our fanship. We're seeking it in our hobbies. We seek it in self-help and in mystical spirituality. We seek it in approval from others for what we say and what we write and what we wear. We seek it, we seek it in the accomplishments that we can obtain, the applause that we can garner, the social status that we can obtain. And we seek it because built into us is a desire for belonging. We were made for something, but we lost it. We know it. It burns in us, and we feel it. We long for it. We have faint memories of a distant world built into us, a world where we weren't strangers and aliens, a world where we weren't dejected and afraid, a world where we could run through the meadows and feel the cold breeze on our faces, a world where love wins, a world where life didn't consist of the financial stress and the difficult diagnoses and the broken relationships and the hectic schedules and the overwhelming obligations and the paralyzing isolation of individualism. We long for that world. C.S. Lewis once wrote, if we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Belonging is about identity. We spend our whole lives searching for that identity, but we can never find it unless, if, unless we find it here at the table with the king who lavishes his love upon us, who calls us now sons and daughters, who calls us out of the things that try to define us but fail over and over and over again. It's at this table we're not just given a place to sit, we're given a place to belong. We're not just given a place to sit here, we're given a place to belong. How does this work? As we've talked about, the Old Testament is a story about a family. It starts in Genesis 12 with uh, the calling, setting apart of this guy named Abraham. We've talked about this. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has a son named Judah. Judah has descendants. Eventually, there becomes a, a guy named David. David has descendants. Uh, eventually, there's a guy named Zerubbabel, which isn't that important, but it's a fun name to say. And eventually, there comes a descendant who is born of that family. And that descendant is Jesus. And he is the one, he's that descendant that's promised, that's, that's the offspring that's going to crush the head of evil in Genesis 3. He's the, the one uh, who, as Judah is, is being blessed by his father in Genesis 49, where he says, there's going to be a king that comes, the scepter of kingship belongs to him, and rulership, the, king, the kingship will not depart from your family until he comes. He's that guy. He's that descendant. He's that descendant that God is talking about when he tells David, you're going to have a descendant that's going to sit on the throne forever and ever. Jesus is that descendant. But you know what's interesting about Jesus? And we don't really talk about this very much. Jesus did not have a wife or children. And some of you are like, wait, so the Da Vinci Code wasn't real? Jesus <laughs> did not have a wife or children. You're like, why does that matter? Well, because the whole story is, is pointing out towards this descendant, and so they're having children and having more children and having more children and having more children. Jesus does not end up having any physical children. 
he does something else. He extends an invitation for all people to become a part of God's family as his sisters and brothers. Paul, one of the writers of the New Testament, grabs a hold of this piece of theology and he says this, that you and I, people who are adopted into God's family, are now co-heirs with Jesus. We now get to participate in his inheritance as sons and daughters. So there are no cousins in the kingdom of God. There are no uncles in the kingdom of God. There are no grandparents or grandchildren in the kingdom of God. There are only children of God. We are joint heirs with Christ, participants in the inheritance that he has given. Do you really believe that? Do you really ever come to grips with what that means? With how significant that is? We've been talking for the last four weeks about these base communities, all leading up to this week, and this week is the invitation week. This is where we're going to ask you to do something. We're going to ask you to take a step forward into something. It's an invitation week. But I want you to hear very clearly what I'm about to say. We are not asking you to sign up for a small group. We're not asking you to sign up for a Bible study or a journey group, if you remember those. What we're asking is for you to take a step forward into a base community where you can experience the church coming to life, where you can be active in the church where you can learn to become the church, to live as the church. And when I say the church, I don't mean Crossview and the stuff we do around here and all the programs that are happening. That's not what we mean when we say step into experiencing the reality of the church. We're not trying to get you to come to more stuff here. When we say Crossview, or when we say the church, we're not talking about Crossview, we're talking about the ecclesia, the universal church, the called out ones on this earth who have given up everything to follow Jesus, who love each other with a kind of love everyone else looks at and says, what is that? Why is it so devoted? Why is it so true? Why is it so transformational? The ones who believe so deeply in God's story that they're truly formed by it. They aren't captured by the stories of conquest or acquisition or humanism or elitism, or superficial religiosity. I do think that's a word. Instead, they're captured and shaped by the one true story about our all-powerful, all-just, all-loving, all-holy God who's using history to move us somewhere, moving us towards restoring what is broken, towards putting things back together, reconciliation. The ones who are invested deeply in that ministry of reconciliation. Their hearts beat for those who have never heard or experienced the good news about Jesus and his kingdom. So they spend their lives announcing it and demonstrating it. And the ones who take this DNA and they do the hard work of planning it and others so that the ecclesia, the church of Jesus Christ on this earth, multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. So on that day, when we finally get to sit down at the literal table with our king. Because that feast is coming. This base community is a figurative table. On that day, when we get to sit down at the real table with our king, it feels familiar. Because in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in our cities, we had already feasted around tables with Jesus among us. Two invitations today. First, for you who might come here and sit down in these seats and sing a few songs and listen to some teaching and try to adjust your life a little bit so long as it's still comfortable for you. Wear a mask on your way out that reinforces that you're doing just fine. I want to talk to you for just for just a second. It's time for you to reject that Christianity because it's not real. It's not full. 
It's not what Jesus has invited us into. We long for you to experience the reality of the church because it's otherworldly, it's beautiful, it's beyond description. Step into a base community where you experience the church coming to life. You say, I've never experienced that. The church feels dead to me. Right. Step into a base community where you can experience the church coming to life. That's the first invitation. Second is for those of you who feel so lost in this world. You've been searching for a place to belong, but you haven't found it. You don't know who you are. Let me tell you who you are. You're a child born into royalty, but ripped away by tragedy and dysfunction, exiled to live in a land of nothing. You are crippled, you are alone, and you are afraid. Listen, out of his kindness and mercy and generosity, God, the creator God, King, Father, has invited you back in. He has invited you home. invited you to find a place where you belong at his table. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Throw out those false stories that you've been chasing and come sit down at this table. Receive the good news about Jesus and his kingdom. Let's stand together. Let's sing this song. And if you want to respond to either of those invitations, I would love to speak with you up here.